Crosscraft that is really around like, let's align to research, let's look at what our best practices. And uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is from the, the framework uh, of Castle. Um, and so before we get into that, uh, my name is Sean. I, uh, I was a, a teacher for a decade. I taught high school physics and uh, was also an instructional coach. Uh, I was also a pre-service teacher at, uh, for uh, elementary school teachers. Um, and also a developer. So did a lot of things, uh, was quite busy during that decade, um, and um, had the idea to build Classcraft in my own classroom. And uh, the idea was really to say, you know, I'm, I'm teaching AP physics kids. These kids are not disengaged. And my classroom was quite engaging because I had a, um, an ongoing obsession with uh, creating meaning in school. And I did that through, you know, let's build hot air balloons. Let's, let's do all kinds of really fun projects uh, around physics. But I realized that my students were also quite competitive and uh, really wanted to foster engagement around the community aspect of being in the classroom. So when you think about it, you know, I had these kids who'd been in the same class for five years and I could pick any student and they wouldn't be able to name everybody else in the classroom. And for me, that was just like heartrending because it's like, in, you know, for a thousand days in the same room as this other person and you don't even know their name. Um, and so I really wanted to break down those barriers. I did my master's thesis on using digital platforms to uh, create learning communities in the classroom and seeing if digital interactions would translate into real life collaboration, which they did. And so that was kind of the basis thinking behind uh, Classcraft. Combine that with the fact that like I'm an avid gamer um, and so really wanted to create a collaborative game-like experience. Uh, so started in my classroom. It uh, was just a passion project for three years. And then from there, I made a little website to just talk about it. I'm like, this is cool. Other people should be doing this type of stuff. And the day that went online, 130,000 people came to the website. It just, you know, started trending on Reddit gaming. It was all over the, the, the web overnight. And um, by the end of that week, a quarter million people had been to the website and the BBC was calling and did an interview on like the future of games in ed. And, you know, clearly people wanted this. So, uh, from then, uh, since left the classroom and am now uh, uh, running the company, I uh, founded it with my brother, Devin, who's an art director and designer in New York, and, uh, and our dad, Lauren, who's a finance person. So that's kind of how this got to be. Um, but at the core, Classcraft is really about fostering collaboration. And when you think about what social emotional learning is, it's about managing your own emotions, but also managing your interpersonal relationships. And why uh, is, is, is Classcraft a collaborative experience? Because when you look at like, people think games, they think competition often. And when you think about what's engaging in competition, it's really engaging if you're the winner or you think you can win. But if you're at the bottom, it's really disengaging. If you're like, oh, there's like 30 other kids I need to beat, I'm not good enough, I'll never win. And so it, competition is actually detrimental to engagement. Um, for kids that are at risk. And so we really created this experience that, it, that um, fosters uh, engagement in a collaborative setting for these, you know, to specifically to address kids that are having engagement issues. And so the offset of that is that you're actually in doing that aligning quite nicely with, you know, the types of skill building that you would expect in SEL. So jumping in, uh, defining SEL, this is how Ca Castle defines it. Um, and uh, Castle is a pretty well-respected uh, group for SEL. They, uh, you know, they've got people from Harvard, Berkeley, Yale, uh, you know, Penn State, all kinds of researchers all over the country are part of this effort around SEL. And, um, and really, you know, SEL is very broad, but it's the idea of like understanding your emotions, being able to project yourself in the future around those, uh, being able to connect with other people, maintain positive relationships, and make good decisions based off of that. So obviously, it's not just for kids. Uh, a lot of adults would benefit from having better SEL skills, <laughs> uh, myself included. Uh, but, but I think- and, and not to mention our spouses, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, or, or ourselves as spouses. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, there's a, we focus a lot of it on ed because we, 
when can you develop these specific skills and processes? Well, earlier the better, right? And, uh, and hopefully have an impact long lasting as, as human beings. So like Classcraft's mission is to create better human beings through play and SEL is a fundamental component of that. Um, and, you know, it really matters for a lot of reasons, but there's tons of research about this. Uh, but, you know, SEL intervention leads to better grades. It leads to, uh, you know, long lasting impacts 20 years later on, you know, uh, people who've had SEL training in school uh, 20 years later have less issues around drug use, around, you know, being in public housing, being involved with the police, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, you, you basically uh, get a return on investment when you invest in SEL because every dollar you put in there means you save $11 on, you know, versus disciplinary measures for not addressing these issues. And so it's basically about helping kids be better people and not from an ethics perspective, but just in, in managing the, the fact that we're, you know, <laughs> sacks of cells that generate emotions and how do we how we how do we navigate that so classcraft's been involved in this for a long time this is a work we did from uh this was four three four years ago but we've we've always been involved with uh this type of stuff um this was a research project we did with um six schools where we wanted to see if we could develop a guidebook for um gamified bullying prevention and so a lot of bullying prevention is tied to developing pro-social behaviors, so SEL skills, um, and to prevent uh, you know, having a culture from which bullying can emerge, right? So if you have this culture that's inclusive where kids are helping each other, where they have empathy, then you know, bullies can't really thrive in those environments. And we, we built a whole guidebook on, on how to do that uh, through gaming. And the results were just staggering. We had like teachers from these schools saying, you know, I teach at an all boys school and I've, you know, these are ninth grade kids, never seen these boys express their emotions, but now they're like literally saying like, I don't like, you know, I, I feel bad the way you're talking to me. Uh, just creating really open dialogue between, you know, these, these boys who are pretty uh, rough housing all the time. So um, really transformational stuff. Um, and so the question is, is like, okay, we know what this is. We know it's important. But then how do you actually do it? Um, how do you enact that change and develop the possibility for students to be able to process and manage their own emotions? And, you know, the, this, is, this is not, you know, Classcraft isn't the only group doing this. A lot of people are doing this. You know, Castle on its own is working with 58,000 schools. Um, you know, it's all over the, the country. And I think that right now that's getting a lot of attention because we're – there's a conjunction of, you know, increasing school violence and uh, an understanding that schools can't just be about testing and assessment and they actually have to be about developing the whole child. And that's where this movement kind of comes in. And so Castle proposes a framework that is built around skills. Um, and so to me, this is really fascinating and important because when we think about SEL, like how would you teach this to kids? Uh, a lot of people think that teaching is, is just related to, uh, intuitively they think this, uh, that it's just related to curriculum, right? So, hey, we want kids to be able to show empathy. Let's teach a lesson about empathy. Um, and in doing that, we'll like confront them, let's say, with, you know, a situation and we'll, you know, try to explain to them what it means to have empathy in that situation. And I think that that's like an approach. And, but ultimately the goal of that approach is to develop skills, right? And Castle proposes these five skills. Uh, these orange ones are about intrapersonal, so self-awareness, self-management. Uh, the green ones are about other people, how you relate to others. And then yellow is kind of the bridge between the two. Like if you're able to manage yourself and manage relationships with others, are you able to make responsible decisions? And so, um, this is a competency-based approach, right? It's the same type of approach that you'll see for developing the four C's or that you'll see for uh, you know, digital citizenship or computational thinking. These are all uh, skills that we want to develop in young people that have, uh, 
actually set rubrics that we can identify and that we can um, tie back to real life observation in the classroom. So the idea is like we can teach lessons, but we, we have to be modeling behavior and we have to be able to help students identify which behaviors lead to success in these skills, verbalize it, and you know, help them succeed. And so when you look at, well, that seems so like seems a lot, to, right? Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. seems to me a lot of this is, is uh, what I would call procedural knowledge. So it's, uh, you know, it's skills, it's doing things. Mm -hmm. And that's very different from what a typical um, didactic approach is in school, which, is, which might be that, you know, we'll show you what to do, we'll give you some exercises, and then assume that you've done it, right? There's, it, this, this would take a different type of, um, of learning, more like probably experiential learning than learning from, some, from, from a curriculum, right? Absolutely, and, and totally. And this is where, like right now, every district's trying to do SEL, and they get caught up here because their experience around education is really didactical or curriculum driven. And if you want to develop lasting life habits around managing emotions, it really has to be around skill development. Um, and, and you have to have a different type of approach to, to it. I mean, you have a different type of approach to developing it, right? You need to be able to do this in real time while doing other stuff. And that's where like, if you don't have a proper system in place, because that's a lot of work, right? It's like, how do I develop and assess student self-awareness while at the same time trying to teach the math? Like, like I'm a math teacher, let's say. Like, that's really difficult. Um, and so, uh, but that's, that's really what you need to, and you need to scaffold it over multiple years, right? What are the expectations for self-awareness for a fourth grader versus what they are for an eighth grader? Um, and how do we build mastery across four years or, or five years or, you know, across all of elementary from first grade to fifth grade, let's say, how do you build awareness around what those steps are and getting students to be exhibiting successful behaviors in these regards? You know, it seems to me that there's also kind of three requirements. I mean, first, the child needs to perceive what could be done. Um, second, the child has to desire or want to do that. And third, the, the child has to believe that they could get to the point where they could do it. So if the, you, have to, you have to plant those three seeds in order to um, change the behavior, right? Yeah, I think, and those are the seeds. You also need to be like consistent. You need a, an ongoing framework and you need to make them feel like they're progressing and feel good about themselves around it, right? Um, and that's where like the engagement driven approach we have uh, for this is really powerful because it's, it's not just about oh, like when there's things happening, like, oh, you should have shown empathy. It's actually like while it's happening in real time, I would encourage you to like, make good decisions. Um, and so like that piece is really like, so when you break these down on, on in Castle has like rubrics and documents around this, what's fascinating is that uh, we look at something like self-awareness and you're like, where would I even start? Well, actually there's rubrics here tied to behaviors. Um, I'm just going to, oh, great. I was just following in chat here. So <laughs> you're exactly saying what I was going to say, Mitch. Um, if you have guys that want to jump in, feel free. Um, and so uh, there's actually real rubrics here that are tied to these uh, skills or competencies. And so what's great about that is that these are observable things that you can codify and uh, bring into the classroom, right? So self-discipline, self-motivation, goal setting. You could easily say, hey, you set, did you set your daily goal today? Um, you could say, hey, I saw you showing empathy to this other student. Um, or, hey, I saw it like that was that action you just did right now was very respectful. Um, or, hey, like you guys have great communication in your in this work group that you've got going. And so these are all like, specifically uh, transferable to observable behaviors. And that's where as educators, we actually have power um, because we're not able, we're not inside the student knowing what their self-awareness mental process is, but we are outside of them and able to look at their behavior and infer from that behavior whether or not 
they have self-awareness, right? And we're, we're smart, educated people. We know a lot about child psychology. We're able to transfer uh, between uh, these observed behaviors into uh, a judgment call on whether or not this student is achieving mastery around uh, these specific behaviors. But to do that, you need to develop them and you need to be able to assess. And so the challenge with assessing skills is that our general framework for assessment is let's, let's have somebody write a test or let's do a point in time observation. And for skill development, what you need to do is continuous assessment. You need to be able to be acquiring data points in real time and be able to look back at that data and see if like, oh, this student last month displayed empathy two times and this month they displayed empathy eight times, therefore we're seeing progress. Um, and so it's kind of the framework that, uh, that we're talking about when we, we talk about uh, engagement-driven SEL. It's really like what we want to succeed at doing is developing these skills, and we're going to relate that back to real-life behaviors, and, uh, and we're going to do that in a way that's a game. So why a game? Now I'm transferring into like why is Clouscraft a good way to do this, or why, why have we designed this approach to doing that? Um, and so you've, you've maybe heard of this game, Mitch, um, Fortnite. Yeah. Once or twice. A couple of times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this game isn't very, there's nothing that special about it except like how quickly it got popular, uh, per se. But what's fascinating about this game is actually what's happening on the right. Right. So anybody who's been involved with kids recently, uh, <laughs> there's a good chance you've seen this dance before or similar ones. Um, and a lot of people know these dances, but don't know that they actually come from the game. And, um, and we can just let that sink in for a second. This child is doing stuff in real life, not to win at this game. So why is he doing it? He's doing it because it's their culture. Um, and, and when you think about what that means, it's like, it's like so obvious. It's, there's like a truism there. Like, oh yeah, game is part of kids' culture. What I'm saying is it's not part of their culture. It actually is their culture. Um, when I was a kid, we would, you know, watch Michael Jackson videos and learn how to do the moonwalk. And, and that was culture, right? There was music, there was dance. Uh, now these kids are learning dances from games. And... Um, and that's really powerful. And when you think about how fast this is happening, uh, you know, the music industry worldwide is a $19 billion industry. So that's all like Taylor Swift, all of that combined. Uh, TVs and movies, so Disney, Marvel, uh, all of that content creation is $44 billion. Gaming is a $122 billion industry. So it's more than those two things combined, doubled. Um, and so there's just been this massive cultural revolution uh, just over the last five or six years in, in as adults, we struggle to even comprehend that that's actually happened. Um, and so Fortnite is just a really great example because it's bleeding over into real life in a very observable way. Um, but the advent of mobile gaming and Facebook gaming has really uh, democratized and made prevalent these cultural norms that are coming from games. And so the idea is like, how do you teach somebody who has a different culture? Well, you learn their culture and you leverage their culture. So we're saying, let's do that uh, in education uh, by leveraging gaming culture. Now, luckily for us, games are also really specifically helpful in terms of driving engagement. Um, and a lot of research from like the last uh, 30 years up until like 2005, I feel like saying like a lot of the research around gaming was you know, do games make us fat or do they make us violent? And around 2005, some of the research started shifting saying like, hey, these games aren't going anywhere. We might as well understand why they're so engaging. And so uh, there's, there's some really interesting work done by uh, Ryan from, uh, he's one of the forerunners of like self-determination theory, which is the branch of psychology that looks at like what drives intrinsic motivation. And, you know, intrinsic motivation is the desire to do something for its own sake uh, versus external motivation, which is you do something because there's an external pressure on you to do it. So, for example, you know, drive below the speed limit or stop at a stop sign. You do those things because there's consequences for you. If you don't, you're not doing them because you want to. Um, 
Whereas gaming, uh, you know, you look at like, uh, let's say math homework uh, versus Candy Crush, right? Candy Crush is this game where you match little candies, super popular, very repetitive. Um, when you think of the experience of Candy Crush, you're literally doing the same exact action millions of times. And like, why are people willing to do that? spend hundreds of hours playing Candy Crush, but these kids, are, they're willing to do that, but they're not willing to spend 10 minutes doing repetitive math homework. Well, part of it is because they have a choice. When they're getting the homework, they're being told they have to do it. Mm -hmm. so, the, or, so, so the the motivation there is extrinsic. Right. Well, it's not just intrinsic. It's just when I know that I have to do something, I'm much less motivated to do it. Like even more in the lawn, okay? When it's like, oh, you know something? It's a nice day. I don't mind taking a walk. I don't, you know, I'm going to mow the lawn. But on the other hand, if somebody were to tell me, Mitch, you have to mow the lawn today, all of a sudden it's no longer an enjoyable activity. It's I have to do it. I think mm -hmm. it's somewhat similar with math problems. It's like if there's a teacher over you saying do these math problems, it's like, well, I don't want to do them. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. But if somebody, but, it, but it, it's actually, if I could choose to do the math problems, it's kind of cool because you're, 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 you're solving problems. But I think that's... Mm -hmm. And, and the, your orange right there, autonomy. Exactly. That's when exactly I where I was going. That's that exact uh, element there. Yeah. So I'll let you, I'll let you take it over. No, no, no. no, but, no but, but, but you're totally right. I, like, and, and there's actually, there's three elements that are identified in this paper, but there's more. But like, one core element uh, is uh, autonomy or controllability, right? And so what you're talking about is this idea of being in control. And when you look at a game like Minecraft, like why is Minecraft uh, motivating? Like there's no story. Well, there is now there's all, like a story mode, but there is no story. The graphics are terrible. There's no end game. What's the point? The point is that you're free and you're in control. And when you look at like Minecraft, that experience versus watching a movie, and it's a very passive experience watching a movie versus building whatever you want in this virtual sandbox. And when you look at kids' lives, a lot of it is very scripted. It's like get up at this time, you know, get dressed, have breakfast, go to school, sit down and be quiet and do your work for three hours. Then you get to go play outside for half an hour. And then it's like back. At, and really the only moment where they have real freedom is when they're playing Minecraft at, you know, 5 p.m. Um, so that's one. The second one is competency. So I think um, there's also like we get motivated by things that we feel like we're progressing and getting better at. If you look at Tetris, Tetris is a really interesting game because there's, there isn't much autonomy. All you can do is drop blocks and place them in lines and turn them. It's not like you're totally free like in Minecraft, but Tetris is one of the most successful uh, games of all time. And it's because there's this feeling of constant progression, right? As you play Tetris, the blocks fall faster and faster and you get better and better at Tetris. And so games are really great at giving you the feeling of like, they scale with your difficulty and your skill set, um, And they give you chances. You're allowed to fail in a game. Uh, when you look at Mario Brothers, uh, you start off with lives playing Mario Brothers. And the reason for that is because the game designers are saying, not only is it okay to fail, I expect you to fail. This game's too hard. You need lives to be able to get to the end of it. And, and I expect you to like practice and get better at this game to get to the end of it. And and part of that is, is in developing the competency, it's the feedback. It's the way the feedback is given. Mm -hmm. And it's instantaneous. It's, if you played Mario Brothers, and once a quarter, once every three months, you got your grade, <laughs> then um, it wouldn't be as interesting. You wouldn't be able to increase your confidence the same way. But the fact that your feedback is instantaneous, that has to be a, you know, a, a big motivator as well. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, um, I think that the, ultimately it ties back into this. You're right to link those two things. Like people think that like feedback is the motivator. But it's really like, what need does the feedback fulfill? And it's really this feeling of like, I get, I'm getting real time information on my own progress. And it's that the, the emotion related to it is, is this emotion of competency. Um, but you're right that games are effectively um, accelerating you being able to map your progress because education is really like slow and giving you feedback. And, and it's, it's also like irreversible. <laughs> right. You don't have lives in education. Right. Well, and, and as you, know, you were talking about the, 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 uh, 
the feedback not in and of itself. I was also Peter had a comment in the in the chat that you know that you get something like PBIS, which is primarily you know negative feedback, whereas in a game, you get, yeah, there's negative feedback, but you're also getting positive feedback, and there, mm -hmm. there isn't a, a tremendous amount of positive feedback in in PBIS. Absolutely, and I think that like the. What's interesting, and we'll get into class graph mechanics in a second in relation with PBIS. I think that like when you play class graph, you get points for doing positive stuff um, and you lose health points for negative stuff. And when you think about what that means, like there's some very strong subtleties in what I'm saying when I say that, because the points you get, they only, you only ever acquire them. And so no matter how bad you are, you're always leveling up. When you play a game, you don't ever level down, right? There's this premise to the game that you are always progressing, albeit at your own pace versus other students, but you are always moving forward. Um, and when you lose points in class craft, you're not losing the points you gained. You're not losing your progress. What you're losing are lives and lives that are explicitly built because we expect you not to get things right on the first try. You're a seventh grader. I don't believe you can manage your emotions properly every day. If you did, you'd, you'd, like, you wouldn't need to be in school, right? Whereas um, in real life, when you start hitting 40, you start leveling down, right? <laughs> exactly. It's all downhill after 30. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so, so I think that, like, that, that idea that like, hey, you can all, like, we can manage negative behavior, but in a way that is non-putative and in a way that like, is clear indicators for you to build your own mastery is really powerful uh, when, you, when you combine that with traditional PBIS approaches. And so the last element is, is meaning and uh, in games that comes from relatedness. A lot of people play World of Warcraft now uh, just because their friends are there. It's a social network. And the relationships they build in World of Warcraft are so real that they'll meet in real life. They'll go to conferences. They'll, there's people who, there's a phenomenon called Warcraft weddings, people who meet in World of Warcraft and end up getting married in real life. Um, that's not uncommon. And, and when you think about it, the relationships you're building in these games are so much more powerful than, you know, let's say Tinder, right? And if you want to meet somebody, World of, adventuring on World of Warcraft is probably a good way versus, you know, swiping left or right based on the picture. Um, and so the, 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 the interactions that we're having in these games are really powerful. Now, all of this is super interesting. It's, ex, it's especially way more interesting when you compare it to education research around how to drive intrinsic motivation and learning. So this is a whole other field, a whole other study um, where they're trying to identify how you should scaffold learning and build lesson plans to drive intrinsic motivation around learning. And the conclusions are the same. And that's what's really like mind blowing here is at, at, what they're calling autonomy in this paper, they're calling controllability on this end, but it's the same thing. And what they're calling competency here, they're calling competency here. And what they're calling relationships and relatedness, they're calling meaning here. But basically, it's this concept that what you're doing has meaning beyond the actual just the experience uh, or more and more you're in education agency which is another term for mm -hmm. autonomy or controllability yeah exactly their controllability agency autonomy all these are synonyms of giving kids more control over their own education and so when you think about it games are specifically designed to be a billion uh, you know hundred billion dollar industry around these core mechanics and education is saying, hey, we need these core mechanics to drive kids caring about their own learning. And so, hey, we have this really powerful cultural phenomenon happening. This is literally kids' culture. And we have a really effective vehicle for driving intrinsic motivation. Let's put those two things together. And in putting them together, let's try and solve critical issues. So that's what Classcraft is doing. And so this is the like, most simple version of what Classcraft can be. Uh, this is a teacher te teaching, uh, I believe this is an eighth grade STEM class or seventh grade uh, in Chicago. Kids are doing their work. And while they're doing that, she's going around and giving them points. Um, and so there's a lot more to Classcraft than that. But at, the, at its very core, Classcraft is like a high five system. This teacher is basically saying, hey, you guys are working well together. Let me give you a high five. And kids 
in class graph, they can also give each other high fives, right? They can say, hey, you, you helped me out. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to help you. And in doing that, they gain points. So imagine a school where, you know, every single teacher was giving 10 high fives a day to different kids for cool stuff that they're doing. And imagine that same school, these kids are giving each other five high fives a day as well between each student. And like just that, imagine how transformational that the culture of that school would be, right? Like, and that doesn't require any effort or any, anything. It's just like, let's focus on giving high fives. The so class grapple we're saying is let's make this smarter. Let's, not, let's give high fives for specific reasons, right? Not just like, oh, that was a good joke. Here's a high five. But actually, like, let's be intentional about it. And let's have a common framework for why we're giving high fives. Let's make these high fives really meaningful. So in Classcraft, you know, you level up, you gain gear, you gain powers that give you, you know, more autonomy over, over and controllability. You, uh, as you level up, you help your team. So let's, let's, let's drive more meaning around these high fives. And then let's track them and log them. If you're giving a high five, you know, you, it gets lost in space. Like you're not, like you don't know why you've had a high five or anything. And, and when you look at traditional PBIS implementations, what they're doing is giving dollars, right? Like, oh, that was a good behavior, here's a dollar. You, this kid has $60 and you don't know why he got them, when he got them, where he got them from. Um, and actually you're, you're in this position where you can't actually understand students' progress. And so with Classcraft, we're saying let's develop these skills, but let's also be able to assess development uh, because we're logging all this data. And so this is the simplest form of class graph. This is a full school rollout in Spain. Um, kids are in, this was a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade school. Kids are in uh, houses across multiple grades. They're, uh, you know, clearly collaborating, clearly engaged, because uh, they're, you know, doing these dance, these school-wide dance battles. Uh, and they're clearly playing class graph because our logo is there. But what's fascinating is that they're not actually on our app, right? And so Classcraft is, is a digital platform to empower this type of culture shift in a school and developing the SEL around it. And so what we've succeeded in doing is this, right? Taking these game mechanics and this culture and transforming what real life looks like to these kids. Um, and so we do that uh, doing three things. The first one is what we've been talking about, like the high five system, uh, you know, non-cognitive skills in classroom management, giving kids points for real life things that they're doing. Um, and so uh, we also do quest-based personalized learning. So that's not really uh, related to SEL unless you were going to, you know, bring in curriculum, SEL curriculum as a quest. So we could do that. Um, what's interesting here is it's about like it would, the way that Classcraft is built, uh, every single piece of it ties back to these specific needs. Like how can we build a questing engine that is going to give kids more controllability? Well, let's create branching pathways. Uh, how are we going to give them a feeling of competency? Well, let's let them self-assess and move themselves forward, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately, we have a whole suite of analytics to be able to look at when and where and how these points are being awarded and how a specific student or building is progressing, right? So you could say, hey, we want to measure empathy. We're going to give kids you know, a high five or experience points whenever they show empathy, and then we're going to be able to track empathy across the entire building for the whole school year. So... For teachers and students, it's like, let's make learning fun. On the back end, it's like, let's actually be able to track these things that we really care about. Um, and so to connect those things all the way back to what we were saying uh, around the skill-driven approach, what we're saying is, let's take those, let's take the rubrics that Castle is proposing and let's assign point values to those. Let's scaffold that across, um, you know, Let's put different wording for fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And, um, and let's help students really identify what they should be doing and encourage them. So there's a develop piece, like we're encouraging them, giving you high fives, giving you experience points, having you level up around this stuff you care about. And at the same time, be able to track a student's um, progress in the back end around these things. And so it's not just about oh, let's teach a didactical lesson around, you know, how to identify emotions. I'll give you a list of emotions, of, of like faces, and you should identify which emotions on there. But actually, like, 
Let's encourage you to do it in real time. And when you do it, let's celebrate that victory and let's track that so we can see how, you, how you're doing in terms of, of moving that forward. Um, and so we're able to, you know, we've got these graphs and you can see, you know, this is for a whole building, but you could see for a student, you could see, you know, alongside just general PBIS classroom management stuff, also these, you know, more robust uh, SEL rubrics and more um, concerted, right? Because if all the teachers are doing this, let's say you're teaching middle school and a student has six teachers and they're all giving points for identifying emotions, you're going to get a pretty clear picture on how that's moving. Um, so that's really the approach. Uh, we have 15 long, minutes, so it's like it take, a good time for questions. Well, how long does it take a teacher or a school to uh, to understand what those different behaviors are that you're that you want to give X, XPs or GPs for? Uh, it really depends. I, I think that like it depends how far along they are on this journey of implementing SEL. Um, some people already have, you know, some people are already working with this and already have trying to implement this framework, already have curriculum attached to it. So for them, it's pretty easy. Um, we found that a lot of districts are saying, well, we're doing SEL, but we, you know, I'm like, so what are you doing? And they're like, well, we're doing surveys and trying to understand how kids feel uh, once a year. Right. And it's like, okay, well, that's a good step. <laughs> but like, we're a far cry from like measuring in real time. So I think that like the how long question is more of a like, how ready are people to be able to do this? Um, but I think that the, the only way you can actually uh, successfully implement SEL is to have enough data to be able to see if the actions you're putting in place are having an effect. Which is, which is true of any initiative in education, right? We should always be able to have a clear indicator of whether or not we're succeeding. You know, there, so, so I'm assuming that with the, the, you know, the five different types of skills, and in, and in this case, there's, there's, what, five different types of rewards, so that would be 25. But there probably are a lot more um, items that you might want to re reward, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you don't have to do all of it. Like, for example, in third grade, do you really want to be developing, you know, social awareness uh, as a focus? You know, the kids are, are maybe not quite ready to be that outward focused. They need to focus on the intrinsic uh, processes. So there's like, I think that you know, my recommendation is don't try to give points for 25 things. That's overwhelming. And don't try to give points for 50 things. Like who can keep track of all of that, but more like, Hey, why don't you focus on three or four core behaviors across a grade band? Like let's all of us, the fifth grade teachers focus on these four things this year. These are the things we want to develop in fifth grade In sixth grade. They'll, they can pick different ones and we'll like build mastery. Um, and, and just pick four or five really core, simple things you can explain to kids, like, you know, you identified an emotion, um, and give points for that in a rigorous manner that's super fun. And just doing that is gonna have a huge transformation. Uh, and, then, and then along that, as a teacher, you can put your other stuff, like I want kids to hand in their homework on time, so I'm gonna give them points for that. But that's like, that, that's what makes it transparent, right? Because if we're saying to teachers, hey, just give points for SEL stuff. They're like, well, this is one more thing. But if we're saying, hey, give kids high fives for stuff you care about. And by the way, here's like three or four other rubrics you could give them points for. Um, then, then it just fits itself into general classroom management. And I think that's the way to do it is to like take teachers in their practice where they're at and just give them the additional simple tool to take what they're already doing and add just a little layer on top. So if some people have questions, you can, I think you can unmute yourself and ask your question or you can ask it in the, in the group chat. Uh, but while people are thinking of that, I have a, a, another question because you brought up before that, um, that competition is detrimental to engagement for kids who are at risk. And it seems to me if you're giving points, then the people who are at risk are the ones who are getting fewer points and they can kind of see, oh gee, I'm falling behind everybody else or I'm so far behind everybody else. Why should I bother? Um, except it's not a, it's a, it's a game, it's a team-based activity, Classcraft. So it's built as a team. 
And so actually, uh, A, you should bother because it's going to help your team. <laughs> and for okay. a lot of these kids who are like, when we go back to like, what is the meaning here? Uh, when we build class craft, there's, it caters to different needs here. So some kids really just care about relationships in class. And we know we've seen these kids. There are kids who are talking all the time and they come to school because it's their social life. Uh, some kids care about progressing. What they want is to level up. They want to unlock gear. They want to like in class craft, there's like skins, just like in Fortnite, they want to unlock heads. And for them, it's all about uh, having a feeling of always progressing and getting better. And then uh, for some other kids, it's about developing uh, agency, right? And so like in, a lot of people think gamification, they think badges. Uh, in Classcraft, you don't get badges, you get powers when you level up. And these are things that aren't rewards. People say, oh, powers are rewards because it's like you can eat in class or you can hand in your assignment a day late. Uh, and, uh, you know, those, are, those aren't like one-off rewards like you get a chocolate bar. They're actually, what I'm giving you is more opportunities to make decisions for yourself in real time, in real life. Mm -hmm. And so we're... Or, or catering directly to this feeling of being in control. So the more, the better you do a class graph, the more control you have. All of that to say that like, oh, I'm falling behind. Well, actually it's like, there's no leaderboards in class graphs. It's not like, you know, kids always compare themselves, but it's not like it's structured to, for them to compare. And it's actually like, I need to keep persevering because the more I persevere, the more agency I'm going to have, or the more I'm going to help my classmates or the more, cool swag I'm going to get. And, you, you know, maybe I'll be behind other kids, but I'm not competing against them. So it doesn't matter. And Peter was saying that um, when he sees other students who are falling behind, those are the ones who need individual, you, you know, he, he knows that those are the ones he should be spending individual time with. And I'm thinking, can you uh, recraft the points to start favoring some of the kids who might be falling behind? Yeah, I mean, you can change the rules whenever you want, right? Classcraft is just this toolbox, so and teachers are in control. They can give points for what they want. They can change point values. I would, so I, I had a, a BYOD implementation in my class, and uh, and we didn't have a firewall or anything, so we had to manage like kids going on Facebook in class, and um, and so first semester was minus ten HP if I catch you on Facebook. Um, and then second term was 20 HP. And then by third term, I'm like, you guys should know it's 50 HP if I catch you on Facebook. And so I would like build in evolving uh, criteria around points. And so if you see students falling behind for specific things, you can say, hey, I'm going to give more points for these specific types of behaviors that these kids are falling behind in. Um, and so like here, Steven is saying, when my kids are behind, I give them extra opportunities to earn points. Um, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like we can create wins for these kids and get them into a virtuous cycle of like that competency loop of like, I am feeling better about myself. Therefore I'm going to work harder. Therefore I get more points. Therefore I feel better, et cetera, et cetera. So we, the, the point system and the leveling up and the feeling of like striving upwards allows you to like kind of flip that, narrative on its head of like i suck and i can't do anything it's actually like here are a ton of opportunities for you to do stuff and and some of those things are not academic right you get points in class craft just for helping other kids every time you heal them or protect them or come to the aid of one of your teammates you gain points and so what that's doing is saying like there are multiple ways to win at class craft it's not just about being the best student which is what school is about the way you win at school is by being the best academic student right um, but in class craft, there's multiple ways to win and, and that's okay. So one of the, one of the emphasis that, where people are putting SEL today is around very specific instances. And, you know, this, um, I get the feeling that the real SEL should be much more inclusive, but still, you know, a school will say, well, gee, I want to introduce SEL to reduce bullying or, mm -hmm. I want to introduce SEL to increase executive function or to get kids to be better at planning or doing things on time. If you have, what, you know, what would be, let's just pick bullying, bullying for, for example, if you wanted to start um, rewarding the types of behaviors that you see, which uh, lead kids not to bully, um, how would you go, what would be the types of things that you might reward? 
well, there's, we wrote a whole like manual on how to do that. <laughs> but the, the, the TLDR short version is, mm. um, is basically, uh, there's different types of pro-social behaviors and different types of bullying, right? There's psychological bullying, there's physical bullying, there's, you know, cyber bullying. Um, and in the same way, there's, there's pro-social behaviors that tie to uh, yourself and to others. Um, and so, you know, not excluding somebody, including somebody, working with somebody you wouldn't have worked with before, uh, recognizing somebody else's strengths publicly, uh, you know, showing empathy. These are all like behaviors that if we were to encourage them, it, does, it stops to be, it stops being cool to be like to pick on somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And what's actually cool is to like be friendly and, and help other people. And so those are the types of behaviors you want to encourage. Uh, but I, I strongly recommend to, to read the guide. We have like whole like list that you can pick out, you know, because what we want to do is create from teachers things that they feel it's easy to observe, right? Maybe showing empathy is too hard for you to observe with your students. And so we, we created like a menu of options. It's like, well, here are, here's a list of pro-social behaviors that fits under this category and pick one or two that you're going to focus on. Don't pick, don't take the whole list. Just pick a couple that are easy for you to observe. And, and sometimes teachers will just say like, I'm going to pick two for the next two weeks. And they'll tell their students, okay, the next two weeks we're focusing on positive affirmation of another student's skills. And yeah, what does that mean? That means giving them a shout out, right? And every time you give a shout out, I'm going to give you 100 points. And that's all we're focusing on for the next two weeks. And, and then you ingrain it, you get it part of the culture. Uh, we have these great studies that have, we have a lot of actual efficacy studies around Classcraft. And one of the really good ones is they, they did a study where they took away Classcraft and then measured if students kept exhibiting the behaviors. Um, and, and the good news is that they did. And so you're able to say like, hey, I'm going to give you points for this set of behaviors. Once it's ingrained, like I can stop giving points for that and you're going to continue to exhibit those behaviors. And so you're, you wait for it to be interiorized and then you move on to develop mastery elsewhere. So it doesn't have to be this big like, oh, I'm going to reward 50 different things. It's like, let's just be focused. Let's get kids understanding what's expected of them and let's make it fun. Well, the other thing that, that I heard you, you talking about is um, it's not that you're you don't get rid of a bad behavior. It's, you don't, per se, I mean, you don't, you don't, it's not like you observe not bullying. You, you're replacing a behavior that you don't like with a behavior that you do like. So you're, so in, with, in the gamifying it, you're focusing on the, the actions that you, that you like. So you called it, uh, or the, your great expression that, you know, have here on the side is pro-social behaviors. So mm. it's, so if, if kids aren't getting their homework on time, you're, what you're, what, it's not like you're, you're measuring not getting, you know, not getting your homework late. It's like, so what are the, what are the pro social? What are the, what are the things that you want them to do? And, Absolutely. And you're focusing on that, and that's what you're awarding, not necessarily just analyzing them on the on the bad things that they're doing. Absolutely. And when you look at like from that perspective, which behavioral data do we have in schools? Think about it. We have referrals and we have suspensions. Uh, that's like the 10% worst kids at their worst. And right. so you actually have no idea what's happening 90% of the time with the rest of your student population. And, um, and that, that means like you don't actually don't understand how your kids are evolving from these, these standpoints. And like, and that's why it's really important to like, Hey, let's, let's, let's celebrate these wins and let's track them so that we're able to see what's happening with the general population, because the only behavioral data we have is about the worst kids. So and I'm looking at the, at the texting here and I'm hoping Peter, that you did find uh, the correct URL and you're able to put that in. Cause I guess you find out that classcraft.com slash bullying. No, that's the correct one. That is the correct one. Yeah. yeah that's okay. the, and I actually changed it on the fly here. So ah, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had an old link there. Hmm. Um, okay. So other questions from, or, or thoughts or how you might, what you're, what you're trying to do in your classes to promote social emotional learning. Um, cause I've been asking most of the, probably asking all of the questions here. <laughs> I'll paraphrase people. Um, 
I just but another thing then for me is we used to talk about uh, character ed um, 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. ago. And now that it's social emotional learning is what people seem to be talking about more often than, than character ed. But what, but why, why the interest in it now? Why is there, this, there seem to be more of an emphasis, I mean, than three or four years ago. I think that there's a, there's multiple pieces. I think, and this is my own opinion, so I don't have research here. Uh, my own opinion and what I've been seeing is a, uh, where there's a big, um, national conversation around shootings in schools and gun violence. And, you know, there's really only two ways to solve that problem. One is put in place physical conditions like police officers or arming teachers or metal detectors, or, you know, let's like, let's make the school like in lockdown mode to prevent that from happening, or let's create conditions where students won't want to be coming to school and in, in shooting. In both cases, it's a preventative approach, but one is around like the, is human centered, right? And I think that a lot of people are looking at SEL from that lens. Uh, and, and, and that's unlocking funding. Like for example, the state of Pennsylvania this year passed a law where they were giving every single school district at least $25,000 for, and they could spend it on either behavior intervention and culture building and SEL or metal detectors and guns in schools. And so um, on the back of this violence conversation, there's actually dollars that are unlocking. And so people are uh, able to move forward there. I think, so I think that that's one part of it. The other part I feel is related to, um, we've just gone through a really big cycle of um, huge focus on assessment and high stakes testing and standardized tests and everything that happened with Common Core under, you know, uh, No Child Left Behind. And um, people worked really hard to like, from a curriculum and didactic standpoint to achieve student success. And I realized that that's not moving the needle. And so now we're saying, well, if we're so focused on great curriculum and it's not moving the needle, what, what do we need to focus on to be able to achieve better outcomes for students? And, and so we're saying that, well, let's teach to the whole child. Actually, we're seeing that like, it's more important for a student to be safe and happy than it is for a student to have studied hard. Um, so I think that there's also like where we're at in terms of like the cycle around understanding what student success actually means in ed and, and wrapping our heads around that as a society. So I think things combined actually make for like, there's just a lot of velocity right now. Fascinating. Okay. And now um, I guess we're over the hour. So, um, so I'm going to turn back. Like if, if you wanted people, obviously, you know, remembering class craft is, is, is one, but if you wanted people to remember, let's say three things from today, what would those three things be? Uh, a, you can get, you, you need to develop skills around, uh, around SEL. It's really important. Castle's a good framework for doing that. Uh, so you should be focusing on doing that. Two, it's not hard. You, you can only focus on a few behaviors. You don't have to change your practice. And three, like there's real value in leveraging games to do that. And it doesn't have to be Classcraft per se, but I think Classcraft is a really easy bite-sized approach to doing that. Uh, there's other things like there's games specifically built to teach SEL. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, those are a different approach. What we're saying is like, just, just pick a few things and give kids high fives, you know, through points and there you'll, it'll be like flipping a switch and you'll actually be able to see a difference. And so I think that for me, it's like, this is an important conversation and it's specifically important to think about using kids, real culture, their games to, to solve these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks. And then just so that people know, I mean, hopefully you're interested in this topic because next week we have uh, two more speakers, one from Yale University, um, uh, Claudia Fernandez and John Joy from Shell Games who worked together um, to, they, they developed, they were developing a prototype of a game to change school culture and in the process discovered how do you change your own culture in, in your organization? So they're going to be talking about how do you develop a positive culture 
uh, within within a classroom, within a school, within an organization, and then um, how do you use that to make the organization work better? So uh, please, uh, you know, check out the, uh, check them out um, next week at www.edshot Interactive. Sean's going to be at Serious Play in Montreal, so check out the Serious Play conference. Um, there's two this year. There's one in Montreal and there's one in Florida, and um, you know, and, and I guess you'll probably be at SD as well, right, Sean? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. we're doing, we've got, uh, there's actually a workshop on this specific topic that I'm doing, engagement-driven SEL, but then there's also, uh, with uh, Kinshasa, who's here, uh, and Eric, we're going to be doing a, a workshop on how to gamify PD as well. Um, so that, that should be pretty interesting. Wow. Okay. All right. Yep. So, Sean, thank you. Thank you and, so much. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll see you all soon. Everybody else, thank you. Thank you for showing up and um, hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you in person, Mitch.